Hello everyone, I'm David Scranton and thank you for clicking on this video. You know, uh, today we're here talking about taxes as we're midway through the tax season. But because we have this special guest today, we're not going to really talk about taxes on this video because today, February 22nd, uh, the S&P 500 has officially gone into correction territory. That means a 10% drop from the previous peak. So I just can't miss the opportunity to focus on that exclusively with today's special guest, Harry Dent. Harry is the editor of the Economy and Markets newsletter, available for free at harrydent.com. Harry, great to have you with us again, as usual. Yeah, nice to be back, David. So, you know, you were here just last year, and you predicted a major, major pullback in the markets in 2022. Do you feel like this is what we're seeing now is the beginning of that? Or do we still have a little bit more air in the balloon before we see that pullback? Or have you changed your predictions? Well, I'd say the odds are we are. My biggest issue right now, when I study bubbles and how they burst, the biggest surprise that most people know little about, the first crash after a bubble is typically 46% in 2.3 months. And, and so we may be, I'm tracking this, this uh, downturn right now since January 4th, the final top in the S&P 500 after a lot of other indices top. And basically, if this is correct, we could be down 40% or more by the end of March. So if we don't, if we don't see this correction here, which has been pretty sharp, get a lot sharper in the next week or two, then it's probably, we're probably gonna make one more run at new highs. And I think if that's the case, you'll only see a new high in the S&P 500, probably not the NASDAQ, certainly not the small caps, Russell 2000 and many other markets. And that'll be a final top in confirmation. But I'd say the odds are we've already seen a top, but, but I'm telling you, when these things finally go after going up and up yeah. and up, it's very brutal. Yeah, and the Nasdaq and the Russell are down almost 20%. And, and I know when we spoke before, you thought we'd get up to about 4,400 on the S&P, and that would be about it. We got to almost 4,800. So I think that's even surprised you. But the market's been resilient. I mean, think about the amount of bad news today just to get us in correction territory. The thing, as we record this on February 22nd, that pushes us below that number was confirmation that it looks like the whole Russian-Ukraine incident is more likely to... Uh, to, to you know, Russia is more likely to invade. But even before that, we have inflation reports that are as high as we've seen since 1980, which I guess makes sense. As an economist, you don't need me to tell you that with all the printing of money, of course, that makes sense. Um, and concerns about the Fed raising rates and how quickly will they do it? Will they cause a recession? But in spite of all that, we're only down 10% on the S&P. So that's a, that's a lot of resilience. What at this particular stage makes you feel as though that resilience is finally going to break in 2022. Well, you know, it, it really is this first crash and I'm not and I'm not convinced yet because when you have this much support, you got to realize we printed yeah. three and a half trillion dollars the Fed after the 2008 crisis the first few years. And then, then it kind of planed out and they just kind of went it steady and just holding high stimulus, but not increasing. We printed four and a half trillion, probably going on 4.6 or seven now, just in the last two years. This, I mean, this is an incredible jolt. And what you get, David, and I've been warning about this, yes, you can keep stimulating and, and they can keep doing it more and more, which they are, but it is diminishing returns. And so the fact that they even have to print four and a half trillion just because of a short-term crisis COVID shows how little they're getting now. And, and the fact that the markets are down this much, like you say, they're resilient. They're resilient for a good reason. All this printed money, if they didn't send checks, which I would do, if I was going to stimulate, I would send it to, to households to spend or businesses. Yeah. Okay. No, they're just basically buying bonds and financial securities in the markets, which means more money, new money, not coming out of consumers and the economy and businesses created by the government that's going directly into buying financial um, <clears throat> uh, assets. And it starts, the government buys bonds, but then those people sell the bonds and they trade up the higher yield bonds and then the stocks. And so it goes all in, all financial securities go up. And the biggest beneficiary for this type of stimulus <laughs> is always the stock market, real estate too, all financial right. assets. 
but the stock market does the best. So the stock market is resilient. And that's why I'm telling my subscribers, what we need here is for the markets to go down enough to break the confidence that has been created because I, you got to realize that. I mean, you, you know, people aren't stupid. Okay. When, when year after year, they just print money out of thin air. And that's the only reason the economy is going up. You got to start saying, Hey, this doesn't really sound sustainable. I can make right. sense, but it has worked enough long enough. So that's why I say, first of all, this is what history says. I mean, nine out of 10 bubbles are going to crack. I mean, they, they're going to make half, the crash in the first two or three months. That is what it takes to jolt people out and say, hey, sorry, so, folks, this so worry, Harry, uh, this bubble's over. It this doesn't sound to to break it. So Harry, it doesn't sound like you're predicting the crash because of a recession. Um, but the question is, will the crash create a recession, right? I mean, there's the wealth effect. And of course, this would create the inverse of wealth effect when people start to feel less confident because their 401ks, their brokerage accounts are worth less. So will that create a recession, which then has a snowball effect to make the markets even worse? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you couldn't have said it better. This is what happens in this case. There's been so much support and so much money in the markets. Interest rates are so absurdly low compared to inflation. They're all negative, OK, even more so in Europe and other places that, that, that basically, you know, the economy still has momentum until something breaks it. And that's what it takes. It takes a sharp enough of a crash. Again, it could just be this, this, this Putin thing in Russia, you know, but the point is these markets are so overvalued and, and all they're doing, they, I mean, they don't realize, they're saying, oh, we're just going to go more neutral and taper a little bit. Look, to feed a bubble like this, which is going on nothing but stimulus, it takes more and more stimulus. If you just pull back the stimulus, you're weakening it. And if you go to neutral That's or right. taper a little bit, so I think they don't understand how overvalued the markets are, how the economy is, it does not have the fundamentals it did in the 2007 mm -hmm. when the baby boom generation was spending more money and working harder, becoming more productive, predictable things. Now we're all aging, including me, okay? And, sure. and aging is bad for an economy. Ask Japan. Ask Japan when they've seen a new high in their stock market since 1989. The answer is never. I know, never I know. So it sounds like the only thing the Fed could do to push this, kick this can down the road is really not try to fight inflation, just to say, hey, we're going to keep stimulating. And that could kick the can down the road. But you're saying just by stopping the stimulation, not even reversing it, just by stopping it, just, just by pulling back, the economy is only growing. The bursting of the bubble. You, you got to remember, when the baby boom generation was rising, it, it, it's supply and demand. It's people growing up, earning and spending more money, and that creates more commerce, and that creates better jobs. And then you, know, you get this positive cycle. Supply expands because of the aging of a generation into their peak, not into their old age like now, into their peak, into their late 40s. Um, is, is a win-win for the economy. Now, that's been over since 2007. I, I was the guy that was as criticized as I am today for being bearish. For, for I was criticized for being too bullish in the late 80s and early 90s. I was saying, you people don't understand, this generation is going to drive the greatest boom in history just by growing up and becoming more productive workers and higher spending consumers, which is 100% predictable. I mean, nothing more predictable. People spend the most money at 46. If they're an everyday person, and if you're a, an upper 10, 20% person, it's 54, okay? So, so these are predictable things. Now, now it goes the other way, and the government says, well, wait a minute, we can't, if, especially with all these bubbled up financial assets, if we don't keep this thing going despite the lack of natural spending and productivity, then, then it's going to correct and crash and then the president won't get reelected and the Fed won't be popular. So they've been forced into this game of just pumping more and more. And I, what I think they thought, David, really um, early on, and this is kind of odd, they thought, okay, this was 2008, it was just a temporary financial crisis and if they just put in a trillion dollars in 2009, which they did right away, very strongly, that would be enough to get the economy on track. They don't understand that the largest generation in history is stopping spending and the next generation yeah. will not come along with enough strength for 14 years to offset it. That's what I study and that's real stuff. So they thought that'd be enough. So they were naive in that. But, but you can't be naive 
13 years later, <laughs> when you're still having to print money and print money and print more and more money, it's telling you that sure. without this money printing, we would have a very weak economy, which is reality. When the economy finally goes down enough to burst this bubble in the stock market, you're, you're exactly right. The biggest thing driving the stock market, and it is because wealthier people spend a lot more and get more benefit, this stock market going up has made people unbelievable rich. Real estate. I mean, people's house has gone up three or four times, and the upscale people's real estate and their assets have gone up a lot more because they have a lot more financial well, assets. And, and they Barry, if you're, if you're right, if you're right with what you're pro uh, projecting, <clears throat> that's all going to turn around because stock market has a major correction. You know, the wealthy don't take traditional mortgages. They'll just, you know, leverage a stock account to go ahead and buy a piece of property in cash. So we'll have to see how it all pans out. Um, you know, I agree. You've caught a lot of flack lately for being excessively bearish, as some would say excessively. Uh, but I think well, uh, only a firm of bear. I've been I was bullish, you know, that most of my career. I started on, doing right. this in the 80s, and I was the guy that saw a bigger boom than anybody else. I, I think criticized for predicting a Dow of 10,000 by 2,000 in the early 90s. People thought I was crazy. It went up to almost 13. Harry, it must be it must be a conspiracy. The Fed is out to get you. They want to make you look silly. So we'll have to have you back so we can check in a few months and just see if we're getting anywhere near that 46% drop. But yeah, yeah now, you know, and exactly, but that's the key thing. If you see, that is the confirmation that the bubble's over. If we get that 40% plus crash within three months, and, and we're seven weeks into that, so we only, only take about another month, five or six weeks to see if this is true. If we get that, yep. it's telling me the bubble's over and you got a lot more coming. If not, it means they may drive us up one more time well, into maybe March or so to, to a near new high or something, and then we worry again. But Harry Dent, we're gonna be worried about we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to have you back to see uh, what happens. Thank you. We appreciate you being here today as usual. Thank you for watching today's video. Timely tax tips for 2022 and beyond. If you enjoyed it, click the thumbs up button, give us a like, and make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel for new content each and every week.